Hi everyone, my name is Justin Chen. I'm a psychiatrist and health services researcher at Mass General. And today I want to start by telling you a story about a patient I saw a few years ago when I was a resident rotating at South Cove Community Health Center here in Boston's Chinatown. So Mr. Lee was a gentleman in his early 40s. Um, he'd immigrated from China to the United States about 10 years prior. He uh, was referred urgently by his primary care doctor at uh, South Cove for worsening symptoms of depression over the past two months. So when I met Mr. Lee, he was really stressed. He told me he had a lot of difficulties at work where he was working in a Chinese restaurant, a lot of stress there, as well as at home with his wife and his mother-in-law um, over how to raise their young son. These worries were actually keeping him up at night. They led to smoking, um, other unhealthy behaviors, as well as difficulty sleeping. He lost interest in a lot of things. And most concerningly for me as a psychiatrist was increasing thoughts that life just wasn't worth living, that he would rather not wake up in the morning. When I offered him what we had to offer at the time, which was either medication visits with me or psychotherapy uh, with a Chinese-speaking therapist at South Cove, he actually declined both, stating that he was really uncomfortable with both of these options. I saw him in follow-up a couple of times, and then he disappeared. Despite numerous attempts by our staff to reach him, we were unable, we were just you know, unsuccessful at this. And because there was no sort of imminent uh, concern for his safety, I couldn't really do anything further. I considered this case a real failure of our system, just beyond what any one of us could have done. And I became very curious about what we could do about this. So I'm gonna tell you about one approach that we've taken here in Boston to try to address this kind of need. We think about depression as being caused by a combination of a person's genes and their environment, and in other words, different environmental stressors that they might, might face. This is what's called the stress diathesis model of depression. Now let's take Mr. Smith here in Boston. Usually, you know, we would hope that he would find his way into mental health treatment either with an individual psychotherapist or potentially medication treatment with a primary care doctor or a psychiatrist. Of course, there are, there are barriers that might stand in someone's way. Um, things like limitations in time, finances, insurance, and as well, depression itself can lead to low motivation and loss of interest that can inhibit care seeking. But usually someone like Mr. Smith do, does find his way into care. Now I'm gonna argue the situation's a little bit different when we change from Mr. Smith to Mr. Lee. In addition to the same genetic and environmental stressors that might affect Mr. Smith, Mr. Lee faces an increased burden of other types of stressors that might contribute to depression. Now, once again, we'd hope he'd find his way into mental health treatment. But in addition to the exact same factors that prevent Mr. Smith from coming in, Mr. Lee also faces a delay in recognizing symptoms, preferential use of alternative treatments, a severe lack of bilingual and bicultural providers in this country, as well as tremendous stigma and shame surrounding mental illnesses and their treatment. And I can't overemphasize this last point enough. In traditional Chinese communities, having a mental illness uh, confers sort of a moral contagion on the family. It makes them, people think there's something wrong with that family, they should be avoided. So I would argue actually that the combination of all of these things make it very unlikely, even if we have a community health center like South Cove right in Chinatown, that someone like Mr. Lee is gonna get into treatment. And even if he does show up, just like I showed you, uh, just as I mentioned in my story, there's a lot of additional barriers related to beliefs. Medications, too many side effects, too strong, potentially addictive according to Chinese patients, those are out. Psychotherapy, why would you talk to a stranger about your problems? This is very stigmatized, that one's out too. And in terms of things like group therapy or partial programs that sometimes I can offer my Western patients, that's just not available because of language reasons. So that one's out as well. So what are we to do? It was no surprise to me to learn that in large nationally representative studies, Asian Americans have the lowest rates of mental health service utilization of any racial or ethnic group in this country, 8.6% uh, versus over, almost 18% among the general population. And these disparities remain and persist even when you correct for supposedly lower rates of illness in, in Asian populations. And among Asian ethnicities, by the way, Chinese are the lowest. This presents a major challenge for the U.S. mental health services delivery system in this country due to demographic trends. As many of you may know, Asian Americans recently surpassed Hispanics as the fastest growing immigrant group or um, minority group in this country. 
All of which leads me to something that I call Dr. Young's Challenge. This is a challenge that was posed to me by my research mentor, Dr. Albert Young at Mass General Hospital when I was a second year resident. And he said, how do you take the tremendous knowledge and skills and training that you're receiving at all of these fancy institutions, Harvard, MGH, and McLean, and bring them to people like your parents who are immigrants from Taiwan? And although this was a very simple question, it has actually shaped my career path and kind of fueled my passion for this field. The solution that we came up with as a first pass to addressing this problem is a group-based stress management class taught by bilingual bicultural social workers at South Cove. And we wanted to make this culturally acceptable to patients. So what we did, uh, and also integrate it very well into the South Cove care process so that we wouldn't overburden already overworked primary care providers. Every year, South Cove patients receive a depression uh, screening exam at their annual physical. And when they screen positive, they're referred to either medications or psychotherapy, as I mentioned. Zero stress was meant to be a third option, either in addition to or instead of these other options. I was very, very fortunate in this endeavor to lead a tremendous interdisciplinary team of eight <coughs> students from across the Harvard Graduate Schools. The School of Public Health students uh, led a qualitative focus group with eight depressed Cantonese-speaking individuals and asked them about their beliefs, needs, and preferences regarding depression and stress. Then the Harvard Graduate School of Education students uh, designed an eight-week interactive group-based curriculum that was manualized. And finally, the HMS students uh, led the uh, design and implementation of the pilot study of this program that I'm going to tell you about. And just briefly, this is a quick table of contents that describes kind of the focus of our intervention. As you can see, we really steered clear away from psychiatric terminology, Western terms like stress, depression, anxiety, and much more focused on things like effective communication, emotion regulation, and cross-cultural challenges. I wanted to show you a drawing made by one of the patients during the session on emotion regulation. Here she's written on the left, I'm very unhappy, I hate my husband, he doesn't watch what he says or does. I think this is probably applicable in a variety of cross-cultural contexts, not just Chinese. <laughs> but then here on the right she said, I would really like to look toward the sky and the ocean and scream and cry. And according to the social worker who led this group, she said this was so powerful because most of these patients never talk about their emotions in this way. The fact that this woman was able to identify her emotions, name them, and share them in a group setting was seen as a tremendous step forward. So obviously this is a small pilot study. We had four participants. We don't have quantitative data. But what we do know is that all four of the participants endorsed tremendous improvement in terms of their own stress, their ability to manage stress in the future, as well as depressive symptoms. All four said that they were either in individual counseling or in the process of setting it up, which is pretty impressive in this population. Three of the four said that they would like to continue on in some combination of individual and group treatment, with the fourth person actually saying they preferred group over individual therapy. And finally, all four said that the intervention had reduced their stigma regarding mental illness. However, three of the four said they would continue to feel uncomfortable sharing these emotions and thoughts with people outside of the safety of the group, suggesting stigma remains a formidable barrier for this population. So what's next for us? We'd really like to do a much more rigorous uh, inter uh, intervention evaluation with a randomized controlled trial in the coming year at South Cove. Like to adapt it and scale it up to a different population, in this case moving from a Cantonese speaking to a Mandarin speaking population. I'd really like to embed the idea of peer advocates as we've, as we've heard from some of the other speakers. This would be someone with lived experience who, who had graduated from the course and could help co-teach along with the social workers. My dream is actually that this type of approach of flexibly adapting different cultural beliefs or preferences could be used to engage other populations that are currently underserved by the US mental health system. And finally, we come back to the reason this whole presentation began. My hope is that this type of work and future efforts will enable us to have something else to offer when someone like Mr. Lee walks through our door. I want to thank all the people without whom this wouldn't, would not have been possible, particularly the terrific students. Thanks very much.